Hi, I'm happy to introduce Jake Bernstein. He has been in this business for, gosh, well, I know you, you do a weekly publication uh, that you've been doing since 1972. Uh, we're really glad to have you here and can't wait to hear what you have to say. You know more about me than I do. That's great. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks for the opportunity. And I want to commend you guys on doing such a quality job. The charts are beautiful. Indicators are clear and crisp. Love it. Love what you've done with the website. So thank you. thank you. I've been in trading for half a century and I'm beginning to feel it. In 25 minutes, it's difficult for me to share, other than a few pearls of wisdom with you, some of the things that have allowed me to accumulate a good amount of wealth. I'm a real trader. I'm not theoretical. I trade what I teach and I teach what I trade. And so let me give you some pointers that have made a difference for me. And I'm talking to you today, by the way, from Santa Cruz Mountains, California, where it is a couple of hours earlier than where you guys may be. The usual disclaimer and a little bit about me trading since 1967, written 40 books plus. You can read this later, not important. I just uh, want to share it with you just so that you'll see, and I do know what I'm talking about. So a couple of things, very important. I'm a numbers guy. I trade by the numbers. Certain numbers are very important to me. Other numbers are not. The bottom line is this. There's a huge amount of information available today all over the internet. If you go to Google and you type in day trading, you will get 1 million hits. So it's very difficult for the trader to know what to do, what to focus on, how to do this process correctly. So the amount of information is overwhelming and you need to focus. So let me give you some ideas about focus. I have a list of seven critical skills of trading. Let me go through them a little bit, and give you some ideas. If there's nothing you come away from this meeting today with, except for what I call my trading model, which I will show shortly, I believe I've done you a great service and it has the potential to change your trading. If you're making money, you'll probably make more. If you're losing money, you'll probably turn it around and start making money. If you're making less money, you'll probably start making more money. So the important rules. You've got to find the right trades. I'll show you one way that I do it. You have to check your facts. There's a lot of information out there. You have to be really careful what you believe because most of it is incorrect information. If you start believing it and you see it enough, you're going to start believing it and it's not going to work for you. You have to formulate your plan. You've heard that a million times. I'll give you an example of what I mean. You have to follow through. Most people are familiar with one type of follow through and that is take the money and run. They begin trading and they say, Wow, I've made 500 bucks. I've never done this before. I'm going to get the money, take it before it disappears. Three days later, it would have been 1500 or more for, for whatever they're trading. So you've got to be able to maximize your profit. There's two ways in which can, that can be done. You have to finalize. I'm going to show you two ideas on how to finalize. You have to keep a record of all your trades, win, lose, or draw. People say, I'm going to learn from my, from my mistakes. Well, it's one thing to learn from your mistakes, but you can learn a whole lot from your profits. What did you do right? How did you do it? When did you do it? And you won't know unless you keep good records. And then you have to formulate your next action. Let me give you some ideas. So think about this. Imagine if you knew everything I'm going to show you on this list and the next one. Let me, let me explain to you what I mean. You need to know what stock, commodity, or forex to trade. That's very easy. Most people know that they say, I want to trade Google. I want to trade this. I want to trade that. Most people know that. You want to know whether to buy or sell. Again, reasonable. But do you know exact time to buy or sell within one minute or less? That is knowable information. You want to know your odds of success. In other words, what percentage of time historically has the strategy been correct? Most people don't know that. They talk about things they don't know about. They say, well, let's look at the let's look at the death cross, the golden cross. The question really is, what's the track record of the death cross? What's the track record of the golden cross? If you take your time and you put it on the computer and say, what percentage of the time has it worked? Oh, it's only been correct 37% of the time. Well, that's problematic for me because I like to be right more often than I'm wrong. But in the long run, it made money. So the question is, before it made money, did it kill you dead? That's very important to know. You want to know your average profit, your average loss, your stop loss or risk, your profit to loss ratio. 
Are you making more money when you're right than you're losing when you're wrong? A complete track record. I'm going to show you how to do that. Average profit, average loss in points and percent. The largest profit, the largest loss, the maximum drawdown, the maximum upswing. Let me talk to you about that. Consecutive losses, consecutive profits. Think about this. I have seen thousands of traders come into the trading arena, mostly for day trading, which I think is a losing proposition for most people, and say, I've got discipline. I went to the internet. I found a strategy. I'm going to use that strategy. They put $10,000 into an account. And the first thing that happens is they lose money on their first trade. They say, well, I came into this game knowing it wouldn't be perfect, so I'm okay accepting one loss. So I'm going to maintain my discipline and trade again. They trade again. They lose money again. Not unusual. They say, well, I lost twice in a row. I didn't expect it to be perfect. I've got discipline. I'm going to trade again. They trade again. They lose three times in a row. Again, not unusual within the scope of what we do. You say three times in a row, I can't deal with that. That's not right. I should have been doing better. They go back and they look at what they did and they say, if I had changed, if I changed this or changed that, I would not have lost money. Suddenly, they change their strategy. Then they lose the fourth time. There are very few traders I know or have met of the thousands of traders that I've coached personally who can accept four losing trades in a row. They say, I'm done with this game. I'm going to do something else. The fact of the matter is this, and we deal with facts, not with suppositions. If you test historically, virtually any trading strategy, even the best ones, will lose six times in a row. Most people can't handle that emotionally, and they cannot handle that financially. So again, you need to know what you're getting into before you play a game. You want to know the accuracy of your strategy, how to minimize your potential loss, how to maximize your potential profit, when to move your risk effectively to zero. People say to me, Jake, what do you do? I say, I manage risk. I don't tell them I trade because if you tell them you trade, they're going to say, what should I do with my 401k? No matter what you tell them, you're going to be a villain. If it goes up and you tell them to, and you told them to hold, you're, you're good, but they didn't get enough money. If you told them to get out and it goes up, you're a villain. They want to sue you. So the bottom line is this. My job is to manage risk. If I'm managing risk, keeping my losses to a minimum, and I've got a methodology that's even 50% correct, I will make money if I'm maximizing profit. So let's talk about that. What do I mean by managing risk? The bottom line is this. People say, I'm worried. I say, what are you worried about? They say, I'm worried about my position in the S&P. It's gone against me by 5,000 bucks. You say, well, what did you expect when you put the trade on? Well, I didn't expect it to go 5,000 bucks against me. You say, well, what did you expect? Well, I was expecting a little bit less than that. The bottom line is this. If you know your risk before you make the trade, you go into the trade with your eyes wide open and you say, yes, I expected a $5,000 loss. It's where I thought it would be. I'm not disappointed. I'm, not, I'm disappointed, but I'm not scared. Most people have no idea what's going to happen when they put on a trade. We need to know all these things ahead of time. The time to take your loss is before you make the trade. If you can't do that, the trade's not for you. So you want to know when to exit your position, when to move your risk effectively to zero, and all of these things. So imagine. Most people don't even know one third of these things. The problem is lack of information in spite of all the information that's available out there. How are we going to get that information? Let me give you an idea. Let's, let's switch for just one moment. Let's talk about what's very typical these days. I took some time to look at some information that was coming over the TV from one of the business shows. I'm going to share this with you. I call this my antithesis because this is what I'm not interested in doing. TV reporter. So where do you think the stock market goes from here? The broker house analyst says, even though prices are making a standard bear market recovery, I ask the question, what by definition objectively is a standard bear market recovery? Then they say, it looks like the market wants to go higher from here expecting the Fed. I say, looks like what? What looks like something to me may look like something else to somebody else. How does the market know what it wants to do? Are we dealing with a living, breathing entity here? 
So basically what I've done here is I've highlighted in red all those things that don't make objective sense to me. Wants to, expecting the Fed to keep rates stable because they are thinking, how do we know what they're thinking? That inflation is under control. What does under control mean? And my point is this, there's so much information coming across these days that's subject to interpretation. I can't deal with it. I can only imagine how a non-professional trader can deal with it. Probably not at all, which is why so many people are so confused. I just came back from teaching a master class at the Money Show in Chicago. The good news is there were at least 75 exhibitors there teaching their stuff. The bad news is 95% of it was not objective. It was unclear. And most people left more confused than when they got there. So that's problematic. So then we go on. Consequently, the Fed will probably not, what does that mean, be a factor in the underlying fundamentals. What are the underlying fundamentals in the foreseeable future? Can we define foreseeable future? I think you get the picture. The picture is this. Most of this kind of information, or on the next slide, which happened just a couple of days ago. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, come on, computer. I've eliminated the next slide. So the bottom line is this. The problem is there is a lack of clarity. If you can specialize and focus on a specific factor, a specific methodology that gives you most of the answers to the questions that I just raised before, you will do well. So ask yourself, honestly, do you have the information that I listed here? If you have even half of it, I would be surprised. If you have most of it, you will make money in the long run. Let's talk about charts. The beautiful charts that you get over here at stockcharts.com, and again, I say they're beautiful. People send me charts like this, and I say, excuse me, what the hell is this? It's so confusing to me. You want your charts to be clear, consistent, specific, not a hundred different indicators. Most indicators are based on price. Therefore, they will show you the same thing most of the time. So decide on your indicators, but then again, go back and ask the question, do they work? So I say, forget about that, but do it clearly. One more thing I'd like to share with you. Since I live near Silicon Valley, i have very often invited to give speeches or lectures or teach classes to a lot of the tech people who have businesses in the area. Frequently, I will go to these meetings. There'll be 30 or 40 engineers there, software engineers, computer hardware people who say, we're not making any money trading. How do we do it? I say, listen, guys, I've got a great idea. Let's go to the computer and ask the question. Does the death cross work? Does the golden cross work? Does the 20 MA over the 50 MA work? You say, how do we do that? I say, well, I've got a great idea. We can do it with a computer. And one of them puts up his hand and he says, what a fantastic idea. We can use computers for this. Cool. So the bottom line is this. We have the technology. Instead of dealing with things we don't know, let's find things that we do know. How often does it work? So I use the following strategy, and I want you to pay attention to this specifically. Because as I said, if I can teach you only one thing today, my trading model, I think that will make a difference if you're not already using it. There are three parts to every trade. What I call setup, step one, trigger, step two, and follow through, step three. Step one, setup. What is a setup? A setup is a pattern. There are literally thousands of patterns in the market. Patterns that most people are familiar with. Reversals, key reversals, breakouts, flags, pennants, double tops, double bottoms, you name it. That's the good news. You can see them on a chart. The bad news is put them through the test. Ask the question, are they totally objective? Can they be programmed? Can they be put in algorithms? If not, you can't test them. If you can't test them, don't trade them, my advice. So how do you test them? That's easy. Most people nowadays can write code. And if you can't, there's a number of programs available that will allow you to put everything in English and back test it for you. So the question you're asking is, do the setups work? Most setups don't work. They look good. The idea sounds right, but they don't work when you back test them. But a setup needs a trigger. So if I say to you, for example, there's high probability 
that stocks will move higher before a major holiday, which we know for a fact that 75% of the time before major US holidays, stock market will close higher. And that's a very, fact, a very important factor because probability wise, tested back to the 19 to the 1890s, it could only occur once in 10,000 times by chance. So that would be a setup. A setup needs a trigger. A trigger consists of a timing indicator. In other words, if I believe that something is likely to happen on such and such a date with a certain percentage accuracy, let's say that accuracy is 78%, I still have the probability of being wrong a certain percentage of the time. Can I reduce that likelihood of error? Yes, I use a timing trigger. These are things that people take for granted, but if you combine a timing trigger with a pattern, you increase your probability of success. Then we go to step three, follow through. Most people know two kinds of follow through, profit or loss. The bottom line is this, profit or loss is not where it's at. What's most important is this. If you have a profit, most people jump out of that trade immediately, as I said before, they say, I've got a $500 profit, I just put the trade on today, I'm getting out. The bottom line is this, if you trade multiple positions, get out of one, reduce your cost effectively to zero, reduce your risk effectively to zero, keep the remainder of the position and give it an opportunity to work. Follow through consists of when to get out at a, at a loss, when to get out of part of your position at a profit, and most important, how to maximize the profit. The bottom line is this, let me show you. At the end of the day, at the end of the year, 80% of your money is gonna be made on 20% of your trades. Most of your trades are gonna be break even. A small profit balanced off by a small loss. A larger profit balanced off by a larger loss. Then you're gonna have your 20% big, big trades. You cannot get those trades to be big unless you stay in them. So you need to have a strategy to stay in them. Let me show you an example of something. If we take a massive amount of history, for example, the Dow Jones from 1901, 107 years forward to 2008, and the chart still looks the same today in 2019, you ask the question, has there been a pattern, a seasonal relationship in the Dow Jones? Does the market go up or down at certain times of the year? The answer is yes, let's find those. So I have here a family of curves. Each one of them is a different segment of time. The last 10 years, the last 25 years, the last 50 years, 75 years, and so forth. And you can see that in this family of curves, the relationship is the same. As remember, I'm a, young, I'm a numbers guy, so I like to look at numbers. Things mean something to me if I can see them on paper or on the screen. The typical behavior of stocks has been to start out toward the low end of the, of the range in December, January, to move higher into March, April, then to move sideways to lower until July, August, and then to make the big move up in September, October, November, December. This is not new information. Everybody knows it. The question is, how can we use this to our advantage? Can we zero in and find the right time of day, the right date to take advantage of this information within the guidelines that I presented earlier? So let me show you something. I'm gonna go back and skip this for just a minute and go to this. If I go to the internet and go to a place called seasonaltrader.com, which is one of my websites, and I ask the question, in stock index futures, S&P 500 over here, for the month of July, has there been anything in the historical database going all the way back to the start of trading in S&P futures? And I wanna stress something very important. Most people in this business don't like to go back too far. They like to look at the last few instances of a pattern because if they go back too far, they find out that it has deteriorated. It used to be good. It's been good for the last five years, going back 15, 20, 30 years. It's no good anymore. So the question is, do you wanna hide your head in the sand or do you wanna accept the fact that certain things work and certain things don't? So I wanna ask a question. Back to the start of trading in S&P futures for the month of July in S&P, has there been anything historically that's been right 75% of the time that has lasted 25, 25 days or less? 
So I want to clarify what I'm talking about. I'm saying, computer, look at your huge historical database and ask the question, is there anything in July that's been right a high percentage of the time for less than 25 days? So the computer is going to give me an answer if there is an answer. Otherwise, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. So what happens? Let me show you. I do the search, computer comes back and says, historically, buying stocks, S&P specifically, end of day, July 11th, getting out end of day, July 15th, has been correct 75.7% .7 of the time since the start of trading in S&P futures. So you'll notice we're going back a long time to get the data. Now, important to say, the past does not guarantee the future, but if you believe that history repeats itself, you've got something to work with. And I want to stress this approach, which is only one of my six approaches that I use for trading, answers all the questions that I asked before. Does it tell you whether to buy or sell? Yes, it says to buy. Does it tell you when to get in? Yes, July 11th. Does it tell you when to get out? July 15th. Does it tell you time of day? Yes, end of day, market on close. Does it tell you your risk? Yes, the stop is 1.5% of the entry price. Does it tell you the profit loss ratio? Yes, percentage win, average profit in S&P points, average loss and so forth. And it shows you the equity curve. So here I am, I've got a wealth of information. Now what, what I do with this information is very important. I'll tell you why. Let's talk about psychology for a moment. My first profession was clinical psychology. My first job was working in a state hospital with psychotic patients. I do the same work now, but I get paid a lot better. So the bottom line is this. Looking at a cumulative performance chart like this, the mind begins to work and it says, well, as of last year, it was at its highest cumulative profit ever. It's working so well, it can't continue to work this well. The fundamentals this year are very different. That's always the excuse. This year is going to be different. I don't want to know about that. I just want to know my odds of success, but most of all, I want to know my risk. Can I afford the risk of this particular trade moving against me by one and a half percent? So I don't look at the performance. I look at the risk. If the risk is okay, the trade is okay, but then I can do something else. This would constitute my setup. The pattern is good. I know the history. I can go to a chart. And by the way, this chart, easily done on stockcharts.com. This was the trade this year. The entry date, starting at the blue line, end of day, exit date over here, trade is over. So when the trade is over, what do I do? I get out of part of my position. I trail a stop on part of my position. And over the next few days, I'm stopped out of my trade, one at break even, one at a trailing stop, and the trade is over for me. I then begin to look for another opportunity. The same strategy can be used in stocks. And by the way, here's the S&P trade. Every trade, every year, all the way back to 1982. Very, very simple. Hey, Jay. Of, yes. Uh, I got a question for you because I'm a big seasonality fan. I think anybody watches Market Watchers Live knows I've got a spreadsheet. I go back. I probably don't go back as far as you do, but I'm also a numbers guy. And I know the 11th of the calendar, of all calendar months, tend to be pretty bullish yes. through, about, through about the 18th, 17th, 18th. So I understand the trade and what you like there in July, but why would you keep some of your position? If, the, if your history is telling you that you want to get out on the 15th, why wouldn't you get out of all of it? Why would you have a trailing stop on, the, on a part of it? Because sometimes the trend will continue. I want to give myself the opportunity to take money off the table, get out of the risk zone. And in the event that this year is gonna be different and continue higher, I wanna give myself the opportunity to take more money off the table. Okay, all right. But well, we that, like, um, we've, we've got about four or five minutes. I just wanted to. Your point is, your point is well taken, but here's, here's been my biggest problem. It took me 15 years to realize that my big money is made in my big trades. And then unless I'm willing to risk giving some of that back on the last position, I'm not gonna make the big money. But your question is very well, very good question. There was one other question that came into the room and it was, sure. about, it was about position sizing. So if you know going into your trade that you're only going to risk one and a half percent, do you back into your position size based on the amount of money? That Absolutely. You're yes. Absolutely. Okay. And I prefer to trade in units of three. 
One, to take my profit target off the table. Two, break even stop. Three, trailing stop locking in a percentage of the, of the profit. So let me show you a couple of more things. We can do the same thing in stocks. For example, 3M, November trade, 81.6% accuracy going back 50 years, 49 years. So again, the question is going to be psychological. Will it work this year? So you know the trade in advance. Let's see what happens this year. And again, I want to say this is very easy. It's based on seasonality. Seasonality is based on fundamentals. So ultimately, the fundamentals are there. I'm just trying to extract, extract the patterns using a search process that will allow me to make money with this trade. And I've done this for many years. It's been very consistent. Here's the entire track record of the, of the trade I showed you. I know we're running out of time, so if there's any questions, I'll be glad to take them. All right. Yeah, that would, uh, was a very uh, um, enlightening presentation. I know you, you follow a lot of rules, and just about everybody we've had on the show has their own set of rules that they follow. Um, and I know, Aaron, you know, uh, one of the folks you really like to follow is Dr. Alexander Elder because of, of rules and you know, trading based on certain rules. Um, when did you first, Jake, begin using these, this set of rules? I mean, everybody goes through periods. I'm sure you were no different <laughs> where you have to learn. You kind of have to learn as you go along. You pay a lot of tuition. When did you first follow, start following these rules? 1972. Really? When you started? No, I started in 67. 67. Okay. And it took me about five years to realize that I was following the wrong rules and I didn't even have any rules. I'd go to the library and look at chart books and say, well, there's a trend line. That looks pretty good. Oh, wait a minute. The trend line won't work unless you make it a little bit fatter. Let's make it fit. So that was my problem. And it wasn't until I went to the Mercantile Exchange and sat in the visitor's balcony one day and some guy said to me, what are your rules? Do they work? Do you know if they work? That the light bulb went on. And that's from that point forward, I started being more disciplined and more rule based. Yeah, I think uh, another one of my fellow um, senior technical analysts here at Stock Charts, Dave Keller, um, he writes a blog here, The Mindful Investor, and he talks a lot about our personal biases that we have. And I think what you were just talking about, where you're fitting the line, you're making it, you're making it work based on what you think it's supposed to do, and that can be a really painful and expensive lesson. My worst trades have been on wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. So I try to be a numbers guy. If the rules don't work for me, they don't work. And it gives me a lot of peace of mind. Okay. So these uh, three, well, four websites that you have on here, this is how people would get a hold of you along with your phone number there. They want to reach. Yeah, they can. And if anyone wants a PowerPoint presentation, I'll provide it to you guys or send it to them if they send me an email. Okay. Awesome. Well, I know Aaron does a, uh, a blog here for us for uh, Market Watchers Live. So maybe you could send those to her and she could incorporate that into um, the yes. blog. Let me say one more thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to diss anyone else's trading style. I just have my trading style and I can only speak to what I do because it's done extremely well for me. I'm sure there's a lot of good stuff out there. I just don't know what it is. Some of it is artistic. Some of it is not. I'm just not an artist. I'm a numbers guy. Yeah. And I always say whatever works. I mean, exactly. I think things, different things work for different people, different strategies. I'm, I can be somewhat aggressive at times and somebody who's very conservative not going to find my methods very um, profitable for sure. Sure, absolutely. It's like the Elliott Wave. Some people are really good at Elliott Wave. No, I'm not one of them. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I have problems with it. I can feel it, it fit Elliott Wave into whatever I want to see. <laughs> <That's> exactly. <laughs> and I don't mean to diss the Elliott Wave people because I know some people who are really good with Elliott Wave, but it's just, you know, it's not my thing. Yeah. Anyhow, really good to have you on here, Jake. Appreciate you, you spending your time here with us today, and uh, hopefully you'll come back soon. Thanks very much for the opportunity, guys. You're doing a great job. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jake.